to the virtual May meeting of the Northwest C++ Users Group. Um, first thing I'd like to do is thank Brett. Uh, he actually had a jump on the, getting the video technology and getting the streaming stuff going. Uh, turned out to really save our butts here now that we're all at home. So uh, thanks, Brett, for that. Uh, tonight we have Chris presenting on... I've got to go find my notes and see what the topic was. Uh, it was serialization, if I remember right. <laughs> yes. Yes, binary object serialization. So, um, uh, Brett, are you on? Did you want to say anything about uh, CPPCon or anything else? Um, sure. Uh, let me turn on my video so people can see me. Yes, uh, we're planning to uh, still go forward with CPPCon. Uh, John is, uh, I guess, supposedly the uh, field trip was the coordinator was thinking about postponing till next year, but we said to him that we are planning to have it this year. So um, if you have a paper that you want to submit, an abstract that uh, the PC committee can look at, please do submit that as soon as possible. Uh, we had 17 submissions already. And uh, so far, I've gone through those and uh, adequately have given our uh, our opinion. Uh, so please, if you want to submit, uh, do that pretty soon. I, I guess we're going to start early bird registration next week. So if you're not planning to present but want to still come and get a lower uh, entry cost, uh, please take our early bird uh, special. If you're interested in coming and volunteering, uh, Lloyd has done it for the past six years. And uh, I know that we've had a number of people from our local user group come to help uh, with the volunteering. Uh, last year, actually, we we're kind of low in representation. So uh, I hope that this year we can get more people to come from the Washington group to uh, help us volunteer. Uh, otherwise, again, we're planning to continue with that. Uh, notes for Northwest C++ users group. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Daryl for joining. He's all the way from New York. Uh, been trying to get people uh, through CPP Lang to uh, get uh, notice uh, our meetings. So uh, we have people from all around the country and hopefully all around the world that will be joining us. Thanks to uh, Lloyd and uh, Microsoft. So those are my announcements and uh, carry on, Chris. Okay, I just dropped some links into the chat column. Uh, the GitHub for this, which will be in the slides. Also, if you're having problems seeing the slides, there's the uh, the PDF, and actually two different ways to get at it, either through the Git, my GitHub or the Dropbox. Now, I'm, the reason I said that I'm doing this is that this is a practice for uh, hopefully doing a CPPCon this year, if it happens, if I go. So, binary object serialization using template argument deduction and pseudo-reflection. It's a uh, two-bit word to get the potatoes passed to you, to get people to shut you up. Okay, come on, slideshow. About me. I've been doing C++ or C for over 30 years, C++ for almost 30. Typically do firmware and embedded. Also have done a lot of monster large scale C++ projects. I re believe in reducing complexity through simplification. There's my LinkedIn. If uh, you guys want to connect with me, remind me that we're, I know you. Okay, goal hierarchically traverse a complex data structure to persist to persist data, serialize, and ideally using minimally invasive techniques. Most of, there are multiple other different techniques or algorithms out there for serializing. 
Boost has one. Uh, Google has uh, the buffers thing they do. Uh, but a lot of them use this. If they have a serialized function in each class. Say, are you, store, are you storing? You write the data out, else you load it back in. Now, hierarchical data is not pretty easy to uh, just traverse a tree, basically do a LNR type of uh, just walk the tree and spit the data out. And so that's pretty easy. But then you get into problems where you have a data structure that looks like this. There's no way that you're going to hierarchically walk this list before you start getting yourself into a recursive loops. Um, that requires a technique that's called object tracking. And basically what that means is every time you visit an object, you have to add it to a map, and by the time you realize you're coming back to it, you don't repeat yourself. But you remember, for example, if we started at S, goes to A, goes to C, that C is going to have to remember that it's pointing at S. So when you write it out, that's easy, but when you go to read it back in, you have to reconstruct that data structure such that C points back to where S was. Disclaimer, this is not production level code. This is slideware. The code that's in my uh, uh, GitHub actually does run. What you'll see on the slides is missing a lot of lines. It's also poorly formatted. So if it on the slides, I would never check in code that looked like this. Uh, I omitted proper error handling just for simplicity. Um, overall, this is thread safe if you're on a single thread. Um, if it's, but over, you know, generally it's thread safe. But being that you're walking a list of objects, you can always end up with troubles of other people uh, walking on your objects that you're serializing out. This is C++ 14 compliant. I cheated. I use C style casts. Uh, you could just easily have done C++ style. There's some boilerplate that some of which you'll see in some of the classes, some that you won't. I tend to do this in a lot of my classes just because I find it's handy and because C++ is missing a couple keywords. I use a, boy, a base pointer. So I can reference it wherever I need to throughout my code and just reference base without having to declare that I'm talking to the base, whatever it is. Um, we'll get to this more later, what serializable node means. But a nice feature that C++ does for us, when you derive from a template, it will automatically alias it. And all you have to do is say the template's name, and it automatically knows that you're talking about serializable node. I also like putting a shared pointer using and a unique pointer in my classes. So that way, all over the place throughout code, if I ever want to use it, I can just say node colon colon shared pointer without having to do std colon colon shared pointer bracket node, because that becomes a maintenance hassle, especially if I cut and paste code that it, uh, if I forget to change one of the nodes, node one, node two, node three, it becomes a problem. Here's the serialized I talked about. Notice this one isn't using the streaming operators. It's actually using a, the serialized function off of the archive. This is perfectly valid. It, this serialized knows whether it's serializing in or out and it switches between a load and save. Get to more of that later. Other half of uh, some cookie cutter shared pointer stuff. I have a make shared that I uh, have a function for. So I can just say node colon colon make shared without having to do make shared bracket node bracket parens arguments. I just find it too much of a hassle. Here's an example of using the shared pointer without having to declare the full thing. This is a standard left and right pointer for a tree. Now this, the rest of this is a little bit my own uh, invention, something that I use. Because this is going to be using a left and right tree, I have this utility class that's called draw tree. Then I just make it a friend to this class, and I can just call it passing in a node pointer, and it will traverse the tree and draw it for me. You'll see that in a second. 
Part of what also works off of that is I have a text out, which is virtual, which I have on my base class. Of course, this base doesn't do anything, so it just returns the stream. Um, I have an operator that takes an output stream and takes the node and tells it to do a text out. This is virtual, so it throws to the derived uh, me member function to the drive class to uh, declare or, uh, so it can draw out its data so you don't actually have to be pointing at the end node. Here's an example of the drive got the same serialized got the same shared pointer even though these have the same name they're properly scoped with node 2 so therefore there's no conflict. Um, because I've already declared the uh, tree the draw tree stuff is a friend in the base i don't have to do it here here i just do the text out i drill down to the base class tell it to do its text out in this case there was nothing to do but if our inheritance change ever our our inheritance chain ever changes it's automatically there for me already and i just spit out data which happens to be an int for this class you don't need to understand exactly what this is doing it's just some stylistic stuff so I can generate a node two tree. Node two is my drive class. Got a shared pointer. Then I just say draw tree, and it spits out a little text version of the tree. And the true here or false shows whether it's going to be drawing null nodes or not. Okay, the archive class. It's let me back up a half step. I was going to make this spoon feeding you pieces of information to get you to deduce how to do it and learn how to do it. My slide deck got over 150 slides and Lloyd says that's going to take you forever. Um, so I cut down my slides by about half. So I'm just more giving you the answer rather than spoon feeding it to you of what I'm doing. So I have an archive class. It takes an iData source. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, we have a streaming out operator, streaming in operator, which is called save and load. And uh, I have a whole slew of uh, load and save functions, which take a whole different bunch of uh, template types. And so it will resolve which one is it's going to call. So this is just a template of type. When you go to save data, oh, and actually here's, the, I mentioned the serialize, that it knows the mode, whether it's saving or loading, and it goes to save the object or load the object, or if there was some error that it was the wrong mode, I throw an error. Uh, what was I gonna add? I guess I'll get it. Okay, the iData source I talked about. When you stream data in or out, all you have to know is that you're going to save it or you're going to load it. And this basically looks like a mem copy. You give it a pointer and a size. Anybody that can read and write can fulfill this. The simplest standard type of an iData source is a file stream. This is extremely oversimplified. The constructor does nothing other than create a file and a mode of whether it's read or write. Anytime the iData source is called, with a save, I just write to the file. Anytime someone says load, I just read from the file. And this is what it would look like uh, in an implement, in a usage. I have the file source, which is a file. I have my archive, I pass it my file, and then I stream out these objects to the archive. Later in a different instance or later in the file, I turn around and open the file for load create an archive from the file, and I stream it back into these objects. And in a minute, I'll tell you why, how we know what type of objects to do it from. Another implementation of an iData source is you can do a socket. This has two different constructors, one that creates a server, one that creates a client. It connects to the server on this port. Uh, when it closes, the file, uh, the iData source of the file, the file automatically closes itself the socket, we have to tell it to close itself. So anytime we save, we just send, load, and we receive. So we can actually stream out from one process and stream into another process. 
The usage of this looks almost exactly the same. You got the socket source, I have my server. I pass that into the archive, I stream out. In a different instance, running simultaneously, sockets are not good about remembering what you passed around, what you sent out. Got the socket and the client, pass it to the archive, and I stream in. Okay. I mentioned that uh, I only have these two operators and the serialized function. They're the interface to the, the outside world. This type could be any potential type. It could be the type itself. It could be an array of types, or it could be a pointer uh, to a type. And I'm grabbing the reference at those so I can, when I go to load the, the data back into it, I can write into that object. For save, I didn't really need to have that, but it's easier to have a reference than making them pass me the address. Gives a lot of symmetry. Of any member you have in a class, 99.99% of the time, it will revert back to one of these. Either it will be an object, which could be an int or a double, um, or a complex type. It could or be an array of those types, or you have a pointer to them. Your only other choice is it could be a reference to an object. References don't initialize nice if you're not doing it in the constructor. And for many different reasons, I pretty much decided I never need to actually serialize out a reference of a class because the class would have already been created with it, with its reference. So of the different types of data you actually have to save out, you have a plain old data, uh, not complex, no virtuals, no pointers, totally trivial, trivially copyable, basically a mem copy type mechanism. Just save and you call the write function. In, internally, this write function calls the uh, data source and write. Load works the same way. When you want to load this object, you just read it from the stream and it writes it back into wherever you were in memory. If you have a serializable class, and we'll talk a little bit more about what one of those are later, and you're going to save that object, you just say object.serialize and pass it uh, the this, the archive. So then, uh, and this function that we saw before, serialize archive is save or else is loading. Um, it just calls it and it makes the object decide what it wants to do. The load works the same way. Load, given the reference the object, just tell it serialize this into the archive. This is a slide we were just at. So we have a serializable base, which is a just a pure virtual class, an interface. There's a couple other nuisance mechanisms in here, but basically it just says serialize. And my class, it derives from it, implements the implementation of that serialize. So you don't actually have to know the type you're pointing at, which is handy later when we're dealing with pointers, because you could be pointing at a base pointer, but you can just say base pointer serialize, and it, the drive class will serialize it out. Reflection. This is something that C++ does not yet have. But when we go to save our data out, we save our data out, we can save an image of exactly what's there. But when we go to load it back in, we need some way to potentially create one of these objects on the fly without really knowing what it was. And so we basically, that's a part of the, one of the features of reflections is to create an instance on the fly. So we just we create that object and then we have it serialize in its own data. We don't know what the object was. We don't know what data it had, but instantly we have an instance of an object that looks and acts just like the one we saved. I do this with a type info structure. <clears throat> and basically I make an instance of this type info 
for every serializable class that's out there. And there's an automatic mechanism that makes it pretty easy. Um, what I do is this thing has just takes a hash to the class, and I'll explain that in a minute, and a pointer to function of a create uh, function, which does basically nothing other than just news. Uh, where do I have? Oh, you don't see, see it here. Um, that news the object of the type we're talking about on demand. This keeps, we also need to have a global mechanism for where we're going to be able to take this hash and look it up and get back this type info so we can know how to create this class. Um, and for that, I, I have a static function within my class, which will be a static. Um, it's a static map. And all I do is return the map. So this is a global single instance. Um, because when I'm actually building this type info structure, a lot of it's actually going to be called before main is called. Uh, so this will actually create this and register all these guys before uh, main is ever called. And part of the way that works is I just call map gives me back a reference to my map. I take the hash and I just store away this, this type info in there. So when I go later, find this hash, I look in the map, give the hash, and it returns the type info. From that type info, I can then call, later I can call create, and it goes to create the function. Um, a lot, and I'm calling via pointer to function here, uh, a lot of people remember the good old days in C and in some of the early C++ of when you wanted a pointer to function, you had to use a type def. Using makes this a lot easier now. This dec this is just like if you did a type def uh, for a pointer to function to create. Uh, okay, and I just store those away, the hash and the pointer function. The, the way that I have a single instance of a uh, class is we had our my ser we had the serialized base in my class. I sneak a class in in the middle of that. It's called serializable. Inside of that, it has a, a static in instance of my type info structure that I initialize statically. Type info. I call the type ID of my class and I get the hash code from it. And also then that pointer function to the new that I was talking about, serializable, this class, create, calls, uh, or returns a new instance of my class. If you notice, we have a little bit of an inversion problem here. A base class knows about a derived class. And because I'm gonna need a instance of this serializable, for every single one of my classes, got a workaround for that. And it's a template pattern that drove me crazy originally. Curious recurring template pattern, CRTP. What it is, it's a template that takes as an argument the class that it's der that's driving from it. So there's a little bit of the inversion logic loop here, but, but what it does is it passes in my class into my serializable. So then I pay, do the type ID of the type of what it is here. And this, for every one of my classes, creates a serializable bracket my class type for each one of these. Serialized base, there's still only one of those ever. It's not templatized. So I can still point it at just by referencing a, a serializable base pointer and call serialize off of that. It throws out to the serialize here. When this constructor is called, just like what we saw on the previous slide, um, we store away the hash code and the serializable create. One little corner 
cheat that I did that I wasn't going to tell you about, but I will. This hash code returns a size T, which on most platforms is 64 bit. I'm cheating and only storing 32 bits of that hash code. There isn't that many classes that I'm going to be serializing out, maybe a few hundred or a few thousand. The chances of a hash collision within 32 bits, you know, 4 billion, is pretty low. And I'm wanting to re, uh, reduce the storage as much as possible because this type, the hash code, will in, end up finding its way out into the stream because this hash code is constant. You recompile this later, the, your hash code will not change. It's based off of a hash, which is a constant hash, which has been defined not to change off of the class's name. So even if it's a template in a huge, long, mangled uh, template, it will still hash down to 64 and then 32 bits. Okay, a couple utility functions that I use. Because I'm concerned about saving size in my file that I'm streaming out, I created this concept, and it's not actually my own invention, but this is my own implementation of it. I call it a dynamic int. I save seven bits off at a time. If there's more data than he's saving, I set the eighth bit, and then, you know, rinse, you know, lather, rinse, repeat until you keep reducing this down and there's no more data. I'm going to be dealing with a lot of small values here, but I want the ability to grow to, in the future to where it could potentially handle large numbers of objects. So I can store in one byte the values between 0 and 127, two bytes, 128, up to 16K, three bytes up to two uh, million. I'm almost never going to have two million objects or class IDs. If I had two million classes, I have bigger problems. And I'm absolutely, absolutely never going to have 268 million classes or uh, types or IDs. So I'm pretty, I feel pretty comfortable by just storing this in one byte. I could have always just used an int 32, but that would always be using four bytes. And that would be a lot of extra storage. So it's just three extra bytes potentially per every time I use one of these type IDs. The reverse function of a, uh, the save is the load. It basically does just the same thing in reverse, loads seven bits at a time checks to see if the high bit is set and, and repeats, just keeps adding it up and returns the int. Okay, I talked about there's three types of data we can save. The, the object, an array of objects, or a pointer to an object. Ah, back up. Um, these are all templatized, so they're very uh, generic, but it's ambiguous because we already referenced that we have plain old data, pods, and we also have serializable data. And how do we tell the difference to which implementation of those functions we use? The answer is the world's worst acronym, SNFNI. Substitution failure is not an error. Through some template black magic and using a standard enable if feature and adding some const expert and using magic, we can do this. We can say standard is base of, is this type the, the or is, is serializable base, the base type of this type, and this is a bool, yes or no. If it is, we can enable. Uh, so we basically have a using that is this whole thing all run in together. I'll show you why this is handy in a minute of how we can use this. I also have one of these for whether it's a integral type, a number. Um, numbers, pure ints, we have to be aware, aware of byte order. And so we're gonna reverse, do some network byte order swapping and storing. And if we say if it's a plain old data, and there actually is a built-in function for isPod, but I wanted to make sure it is isPod and not integral type. 
Otherwise, these become confused between each other. And plain old data uses the enable if also. These are, now I couldn't find an actual real good name for them, so I call them conditional templates, but it's using the Sniffene, and I always pronounce that wrong. Uh, you basically say template, if serializable, this type, this function exists. If this type is not serializable, it's like this entire template statement did not exist. Therefore, it's no longer a candidate to be compiled. So you're not going to get those reams and reams and reams of errors that templates typically do of say, you know, doesn't match, doesn't match, doesn't match. Symmetrical, we have the is if serializable for load, the array types for load and save, and the saving the pointers. One extra argument that's in this is this void right here. This is part of the mechanism of how this uh, template conditional works. This is the return type of this function. And when it mangles this and it doesn't exist, there is no type, this void gets eaten, so therefore this is not a valid function. If we were going to have some other type, and one of my earlier designs did, I actually had every load and save return a reference to the archive object so I could stack these up or just return the, the reference to the archive. I no longer wanted to do that, uh, and I may point out later, but it, I don't need to. Okay, we have the same type of uh, special casing for the conditional templates for the uh, integral types, integral types of arrays. Um, not bothering with uh, pointers to arrays, or pardon me, pointers to ints, because that's just a pointer, and we'll see that will actually be handled later. Pointers themselves don't actually care about byte order. Okay, we have the plain old data that we have the object in the array. This is grayed out because I'll get to it later. The pointer to that type. And I kind of showed you this before. I just This is just a save. It's a mem copy. The data, the address, and the size. You just write it out. Load, you just load it back in. When we're loading it back in, we have a reference to whatever object it was that came in through the streaming operator, which was also a reference. Therefore, this is writing back directly into the instance in the class of this data. So it's reloading the data directly back in the class. Arrays are almost just as simple. I save the count of the array. And actually, I'm not sure if you guys have seen this type before, but an array of a template, you can say give it the type and the count and it'll automatically deduce you've passed it in an array and it figures out how long the array is. So this has to be an actual real array, not a pointer to an array. So it will not detect that for you. It doesn't do any bound checking on pointers. This is actually a real array object. So we know how long it is. I save out the count and then we save the array uh, on the size of the array. This is of the entire array object. So if it's 20, elements long of a 32-bit int that's going to save 80 bytes based on this address. The load, almost as simple. We get our array type, our type, the actual array element in the count. I read back in, do a dynamic, or load a dint, get the count from the archive of how many objects it thinks it saved out. Because this array type itself is hard-coded, it's um, we know it, we know the count of the actual storage. I make sure that the count that we wrote out and the count of our local storage are the same. If it's not, it returns an error. And then I just do a the reverse of the load, right into the array, the size of the bytes that I had written out. Um, a little tricky gotcha here. This is returning a void. But I say return error. This error is actually a void function. It's 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 setting an error bit, or it's actually a counter, and it just increments how many errors I've had. 
but it's actually returning a void from this error. It's a hack, illegal though. Okay, if something serializable, um, save passing the reference or the array, almost looks the exact same, but here's how it's different. I save the type of the object, get to that in a second, and we just then tell the object to serialize itself out and pass it the, the this, of we're in the archive class. So we're telling the object, serialize yourself into this archive. Um, then we have the, we actually read from the stream, the, the type that was written out there. Here again, I'll show you that in just a second. I make sure this type that we just read in is this, well, first of all, I make sure that we did find that type in our class, in our, compilation it's possible you go to load a file and you didn't compile in that class and therefore its type info is not going to be in the in your compilation so but then i also make sure that the type info that we just read in from the file is the same type info of the object uh, that's out there this is one of the virtual functions that's hidden in the serialized base that ends up getting handled by the serializable class, and it just gets its static instance of the type info. Here again, we just serialize it back in, tell the object to serialize yourself from this stream. Okay, the save type. So I mentioned that in the middle class, a serializable object has the type info in it. So serializable base throws a virtual and I, and I just call it get type info. That just gives me a pointer to that type info struct we had a minute ago. I keep track of every object I've written out. So I have a map of type infos or of type IDs. <coughs> if I've um, already seen this type info, it looks it up and it finds it. Um, assume I didn't. I grab the next type ID, write that back into the type ID. I don't have to add it back into the map because this type ID is a reference to the element in the map. So when I go to assign this uh, next type ID, it just writes it back into the map for me. I save out this type ID, um, which is this incremental value, and then I get the hash from the type info and I save out the hash. <clears throat> and I just say save hash, and it automatically knows what the type of the hash is, and it goes to save it using regular serialization. If this value came back that I had already serialized it out and I knew what it was, I only need to save the type ID, because I know that when we go to read back in, which you'll see in a second, I already have looked up and has stored away what the hash was for that. <clears throat> so on the loading of the type, I read from the stream, I get the type ID, I look it up in the map of ID types, which um, you'll see here in a second what it is, that if it knows that about this type info, that means I've seen it already and I just return it. If I haven't seen it already, I... I know the next thing in the stream is going to be the hash. I suck in the hash and I go and I call type info find hash, which then looks it up in the type info map and returns me the type info. Remember, see, everything you stream out and stream back in, you have to do symmetrically. So we saved, we, or we loaded back in this int, dint which maps exactly to what we had saved out here. When we go to, when we saved out this D and the type ID for the very first time, I saved the hash. I never need to save the hash again. Um, so then I load the hash and then I can look it up. Okay, if it's an array of element, of, serializable types. I save the count 
I save what the type of the array is, same mechanism we just used, and then I just iterate through every object in there in the array until it just serializes itself. I don't actually need to worry about what the serialized implementation is here because I know the item will take care of it for itself. Loading it back in, kind of the same mechanism. Uh, the mirror image, I read the count. I make sure the count is what the count as I was expecting here. I read the type info. Um, and from that function uh, that we just talked about, I get the type info. I verify the type info exists and it's the right type of this array. If it's not, I turn an error. Otherwise, I just iterate through every member of the array. Even though the array being passed into us is empty, it has a size and there are elements for everyone there. I just iterate through each one and I serialize back into it, passing it the archive. Okay, the integral types, uh, the special type, or the uh, dealing with the byte order, almost the same as other saves, but I do a little bit of type magic. I make an unsigned type of whatever this type was. I cast this data to an unsigned type of that. I sw swap the byte order, and inside of byte order, it automatically knows if it's on a little Indian or big Indian machine and if the data needs to be swapped or not. Then I just write out the storage and the size of whatever that is. It could be a 16 or 32 or 64 or 128. Technically, when I call a to save a byte out, it will go pass through this thing also, but you don't need to swap bytes in a byte order. Loading it back in, I make the same make unsigned type. I, inst I make one of these locally on the stack, I read into it, then I do the byte order swap. And, and then I write that byte order swap back into here point here, I made a local copy of it on the stack here. So when I pass it through the byte order swap, I'm not writing back to when I'm doing the save. I'm not corrupting data in my actual original storage. I'm doing it just purely on a copy of it. Same thing here. I have a copy or not a copy, but a local instance that I'm loading in and then swapping. And then that gets written back to the data here. Um, for the an int array, I actually do not handle byte order here. I save the count. I just iterate through every item. This save calls the uh, templatized function of knowing how to handle that type. Since it's also an integral type, it will call the same routine we just saw and do the byte swap on there for us. This is a key part of the philosophy of not repeating yourself. If I were, I could have done all this byte swapping here, but if there was a bug in it and I fixed it in one spot and not the other, it's just an extra bug. So may, just do it once somewhere else. Uh, this load works just like the, all the other array operators, get the count, make sure the count's right, iterate through every item, loading them in. Okay, plain old data, saving a pointer of an object out. We end up with a couple different arguments here. If you have a pointer to an object in your class, how do you know it's not really a pointer to an array? Um, and also comes up the question of who owns this memory and who's responsible for freeing it. Also, what if when we're talking about climbing through our tree hierarchically, it spits back or it points back to a higher point in the tree and we get a loop in our hierarchical structure. Um, so I have to maintain a map of every object we save out. It's the, the pointer that was given to us, a POBJ, 
I look it up in a, in a map of object IDs indexed by the P obj. Going, have I seen this object already? No. I get the next object ID, and this uses the same reference trick of writes the object ID back into the map because this is a reference. I save out the object ID, and for the first 127, these are going to be small values, one byte. That's where I'm compounding my uh, saving of storage doubt. This object could have been just about any different type of object, but I defer it off to another template, a template function that knows how to save out the instance of this object. The other path we could have taken through here is if I had actually already seen this object, um, meaning I've already saved out this pointer, all I have to do is write the object ID that I got last time. So all of a sudden, a potential, rather than storing an entire object out there again, I'm potentially just writing one byte of an object ID, or two if I have a lot of them. Um, so therefore, I'm really, really compounding my saving again. Um, loading it back in, little little magic here. I do a, a load the D end, gets my object ID, I look it up in the map, and when I stored it away in the map, it was a pointer to this type of object. The, the map itself is a void. So I cast it back to the right type. This is a pointer to, it's a reference to a pointer, which could be null at this point. If it is uh, not, if it is null, that means we, we streamed out a null object and I just write null back into the outside object. Um, but the very, every time you go to index into a map and it doesn't exist, it returns null back. So I had to have some mechanism to actually figure out, was this one that I had just never seen before, or was it actually null? And when I loaded this, uh, object in with the object ID, I actually had looked up in the map when I saved it out, and I'll go back to the slide in a second. The object ID was an ID null, which actually has a value of one. So my ID, my next ID, my next object ID counter that I had actually starts at two. I'll go back to the slide. So when someone passes in a null, it gets an object ID of one back, which means, oh, I know what this object is. I just write out the one for the object ID, which happens to be the special case of null. Okay, assuming it's not null and we didn't write the null back, we go out and one of the rules I had to make for myself is because we had the amb ambiguity of the load or of the pointer of what, how many were, was this, you know, was, was an array or not, and, and who owns it. I basically decided if I have a pointer to it, I can do it, I own it. And there's only one of that type out there. So I knew that type. I don't know what the type is. The template figured it out for me. So I just knew whatever that was. And then I serialize in to that object as if it was a full instance of that object, the load via this uh, load and save. Um, ever take the new, assign it back to the outside object. So if this object had been, was pointed at by four, or four or five different places pointing at the same object, it's going to get the same object ID back. Therefore, we're going to know it's the same pointer. And so the first time in, we create the object. Each additional time through there, we just point it back to what the original object was. 
And we'll see some of the beauty of that mechanism later. Remember that graph from the very beginning, which is just kind of the spaghetti of arrows going every which way. No one, no even easy hierarchy. Okay, now we have the if serializable for the pointer type, when we're going to save out the pointer of an object. It has some similar concepts of what we were just doing there of the object ID. If we've already seen the object ID, we write it out and we return. If it's a new object, we write the, the object ID back via the reference into the map, save out the object ID, save out the type of this object because we know that these are serializable, so we can actually ask it for its type. We get it at its type ID, and if we if we don't haven't saved the type ID yet, we save the hash. Then we just call the object and say, serialize yourself into this archive. So it automatically, automatically reloads itself. I don't need to know what type it is. I just tell it to, I delegate it and I tell it to do it for itself. The load does the exact same thing as the other save, or as the other load for the pods. I load the int, dint, I look up the object ID, have I seen this before, or is it null? If it's null, I just write it back. If it's object ID is null, I, I follow this way. Otherwise, I go out and load the type, which looks up the type info for me. If it was just an object ID, the very first time, it, it looks up an object ID, finds a null, reads the hash, and the hash looks up the type info structure and stores that back in the map. Second time through, the object ID is only the object, it was only an object ID, potentially only a byte. And from that uh, object ID, it saved in its map the type info, it returns it to me. Then I call type info create, blammo. Now I have a new object from potentially only a byte of the ID of what this type of object was. I went out and actually nude one of these objects. And then I serialize into this new object uh, using the stream and it reconstitutes itself and I signed it back out through pobj, the reference there. There's also a hand, handful of standard STD specializations which are real handy to have, which are potential actual objects you'd find in a class also. You have shared pointer, unique pointer, vectors, lists, arrays, or maps. <coughs> this does not need to know anything about whether they're pods or they're uh, whether they're serializable or not. It just iterates through them, or in this case, a shared pointer has a single pointer. I get the pointer. I saved it this out. This saves using the type star mechanism that we just went through. So it saves a pointer to this out there. If this shared pointer is actually pointing at a dozen different places, or pardon me, a dozen different shared pointers are all pointing at the same address, they all get the same pointer back and they save the same pointer. Very first time it saves the instance of the data. Every time after that, it's just the object of the data. Load is kind of the reverse. I actually uh, see this is a shared pointer of this type. I tell it to load that type. If this type was not null, I do some magic of, well, let me actually back up a little bit here. Um, I store it away in an object map that's a map of shared pointers. And they're shared pointers of a serializable base. I put them into this map as whatever the drive type that came through here. Or actually, I take, take that back. They're not necessarily serializable base. Um, they uh, are potentially whatever. Uh, but they are a shared pointer. Uh, I cast it back to the right type, and this is a reference to this map 
if there is no type, I'm getting myself looped in here. I actually go out and create an instance of a shared pointer of that type, assign it that value. This writes back through this type back into this map because this is a reference. So I now have a shared pointer from just a regular pointer of the uh, type object and I write it back into the pointer to the outside world. This load that was done here is automatically figured out that this was a type star. And just like this one was a type star, it loads it using the this same uh, load and save for the type star. Or it could have been a uh, one of the pod types. Whoops, going the wrong way. Unique pointer kind of works the same way, but I don't need to worry about shared pointers. You're, in theory, you should never have multiple unique pointers pointing at the same guy. They own it. So we just to get the get the object, save it out, the type star serialization or template uh, function handles it. Loads here just loads the type star of that converts it to a unique pointer and writes it back. A vector, almost like the, an array of an actual physical array, we get the size, we save it out, we just iterate through every item and have it know how to save itself. Loading, get the size, I make sure the vector is clear, I reserve enough space in it ahead of time. This saves me from reallocating of growing the vector every time I add another item to it. And then I load it and I push it back in the vector. List, almost identical, get the size, and I go through, or I save the size, uh, and I go just go through every item in the uh, list, saving it out. Loading it back in, I get the size, I make sure the list is clear, and of course, the list is empty here before I've loaded in, so I just can't iterate through every item. I know the count, so I just do a loop of keep on reading in that many size objects, pushing it to the back. Array, almost same type mechanism. Map, very similar, except for rather than just storing what I'm referencing i we, we have both a pair for the fir, for the first and the second the key uh, and the value and i'm not sure if you've seen this all already also but a template can automatically deduce the the key and the value of a map if you're passing a map in as a reference that's a real handy little thing to do when i go to load it back in i have to make a instance of a key, instance of a value, serialize into those, and then make the map, assigning map sub key the value. So I have functions for basically shared pointers, unique pointers, vectors, lists, arrays, and maps of all these different types. These types are not all the same type. Every instance of a template function is its own, own whole new pattern match. Using those functions, I potentially actually could have had a, uh, a vector of lists of shared pointers of serializable objects. It would deduce that it was a vector, use the load save vector of this type, where the, this type was list of shared pointers of serializables, Using deducing that it was a list, it would use load list where this type was a shared pointer to a serializable. Then it would use deduce that it was a shared pointer, use a shared pointer template function where the type was serializable. And then the SIFNA would then call the conditional or the is serializable load save. So Nesting of nesting of nesting of types. When you see a whole mess of types in a 
class. These are all different types. If this was a template that had type here, they would all be the same then. But these are each, but these are member functions, template member functions. So each one of these potentially can be its whole new own type. Okay, so what does a serializable class look like? We actually saw one of these before, but I just kind of skipped what some of it was. We have our node, left and right pointers, and a data. The only thing that's different from this from a regular class is it derives from a serializable template node, note, serializable referencing back the uh, CRTP, curiously re reoccurring template pattern. We add a serialized function to it. We say is safe, we stream out the data. The, the data on the left and the right, if we're loading, we stream it the other way. So if you didn't have this and didn't have this, this would just be a standard left-right tree. So we have some magic function that generates us a tree of data. Ah, I didn't use my sh nice shared pointer type. Forgot to do that there. I draw the tree, the function I showed you before, just so you'll see what's there. Create a file, I'm saving, create an archive, I archive it out. Closing curly brackets, the file is closed, the archive is destroyed. Create an empty pointer, shared pointer of PN of, of type node. I create a, open the file for loading, create the archive off the file, and I ar archive in, and I draw the tree back out. This is the tree I wrote out, this is the tree I wrote, read back in. Also, main node in the um, GitHub, there's, this is already there for you. All you have to do is just straight compile it. There's the output. Multi-level hierarchy. If you have sets of classes that inherit from each other, but there's some chances of that this thing's gonna, your hierarchy tree is gonna be divergent. You're gonna have a lot of different leaf nodes some of which may be serializable, some that may not be. Your middle layers of, are ob, in your tree are also objects that may be serialized themselves. This is a just a left-right tree uh, that's a, and it knows that it's serializable. It has type information. Um, despite the fact that I know there is no base underneath this guy that's going to be serialized. Even though I did put the base here, I can just call base serialize and it calls into serialize a base and it knows it just returns because there's nothing to actually save out there. This way, if some point in the future my hierarchy changes, I don't have to go through and reimplement and change what my serialize is. Serialize, it's like constructing. It's inside out, destructing outside in, serializing, always same order. So I always do base first, then, then left and right. Now in the derived class, we still use our serializable base class, but there's a default parameter that was here. The default parameter was that this inherited from serializable base. Here, we're inheriting from node. This is class node two, serializable node two, derived from node. Um, and all I would do is serialize the base. Don't know what the base is, it's just in node, which is really serializable. Um, and then when I serialize out the data. Another, I could have just directly said node, colon, colon, serialize. But I would actually be skipping steps in my hierarchy. This hierarchy is it's node two that's derived from a serializable template, that's derived from node, that's derived from a serializable template, that's derived from node base. If I were to just call directly node serialize, it would work. But I'm skipping skipping levels in my hierarchy. And if someone ever changes with the inheritance chain here. 
I don't have to worry about it changing. Or if serializable had actually had something that it wanted to serialize out, I don't have to worry about that changing. It, it automatically just does it. It's one less maintenance point for me. Okay, I don't actually have code for showing that multi-level. I, I think there actually might be some out there, but you, you can see how it works. Okay, now object tracking, if we have a bunch of shared pointers that all point at similar objects, very simple, similar pattern you've seen already. I got node four derives from serializable node four. I have a shared pointer, whoops, typo. That should be node four right there. Um, I got a constructor for my node four that just saves a name away. Uh, skip this. I have a, a Veridac template here that I want to connect a whole bunch of points to a whole bunch of other points. I got shared pointer first and the rest. I take the first and then I add it to my vector pushback. I give a vector. It's a vector of shared pointers. I add the first pointer to it. It returns here the rest. Say there's four or five. Splits off the first one. Calls the first. You guys, I think, have all seen Veridac templates. Um, my serialize, I serialize out the name when I gave the object. And this is just so I can demonstrate what is being written in read and written at any time. So if I'm saving, I'm showing a less than, of otherwise loading, showing a greater than, and the name. And then I serialize in the vector. Even though this is a vector of shared pointers, I don't have to go through the entire vector myself. I just say serialize vector. And the uh, template pattern matching it, argument deduction figures out its shared pointer and takes care of it for me. And even better than that, this is a vector of shared pointers of node fours because it's kind of a double layer of indirection there. So pattern you've seen before. I, I have a file for loading. I have a function called save that I'm going to pass this into. I'll show you that in a second. Mirror image of that, I have a file, the file name I'm loading. And I have a function called uh, load, I'm passing it the file object in. Save takes I data source, creates an archive, generates my node data tree, which you'll soon find out is or is not a tree. Uh, do some C outs. I serialize the object out, um, closing uh, C, uh, count. When I go to load it, I just take a source. Archive, um, create a pointer for this data to appear in, and then I uh, save it, or then I load it back in. Now, on all my other examples, I drew that little text tree. This is my data structure to generate node four. I made five pointers, A, B, C, D, E, named them A, B, C, D, E, but then using that Veridac template, I said, I want to connect A with B, C, D, I will connect B with A, C, D, E, yada, yada, yada. So every pointer, or every object is referencing every other object in here. No clear hierarchy. Any one of these objects I can use as an anchor. I just happen to choose A, wham, A, and I'm going to tell it, and I serialize out A and then I can read it back in. Obviously, I can't print it with a text tree, but those little arrows I did, so the first half of the, of the file, saving data, writing A, writing B, writing C, writing D, yada, yada. Loading data, loading A, loading B, loading C, loading D, loading E, done loading. The second half, I'm doing a client server. I spin up a thread, with a server uh, function, I also spin up a client. And I'm just gonna basically wait for them to each finish their functions and then go away. Here's what client and server are doing. That makes a uh, server socket object. 
and I pass it to that same save function that I had before, where I just pass it an ID to source and it tells it to save it. The, um, let me check something. The socket source, here's a client connected to the server. I pass it the client data source, exact same functions as we had before for our load and save. I just create an archive out of it, save it out. Create an archive out of it, stream it in. But remember, these are in threads. These are running simultaneously. When we were looking at this before, we saw nice ordered, whoops, too far. Nice ordered data of them being written out. Also notice that even though A was pointing to every one of these objects, B didn't write out every object he was pointing to. C didn't write out every object he was pointing to. They already knew the other objects had already been saved, so they didn't save it. They only saved what was further down the chain. So, okay. So we just saw these. These two are running in separate threads at the same time, speaking to each other over a socket. The data are being written and read simultaneously, starting loading, starting saving. So it's writing A, reading A, writing B, reading B, writing C, reading C, yada, yada, done saving, done loading, client server done. And notice that they're not actually all perfectly interlaced because threading is non-deterministic. Okay, now we have a socket that was running between two different processes, potentially on two different computers, or actually even potentially between just threads on the same computer. Sockets, you can both read and write to the same socket. So I made a synchronous reversible two-way archive. This is gonna be my object. It's basically just a straight left, right tree has a na name and a value. However, as I create these, they will actually get inserted in order. If new is less than this, it chases down the left tree and goes to insert it. If it left doesn't exist, it assigns it. Same thing with the right. You guys have all seen those before. I go to serialize in and out. Here's another handy thing of serialize returns a reference to the archive. So I can just say archive serialize dot serialize. And I could string out these dot serialize forever. Same thing with the streaming left and right operators. I could, could have done archive stream name, stream value, stream left, stream right. And with the if, and so it really can make it nice for compacting data. Um, normally, I wouldn't double stack these. It's hiding kind of an obfuscation. I needed space, and I wanted to show that it could be done. So I spin up two threads, a client and a server. And I wait for them to return. My server thread. I get a little random number utility. I create a new server socket, create my archive. I create a root node in my tree. I I'm going to say I'm going to go through this loop five times. First time through, it writes the tree out. Then it's going to go read it back in. This archive just changed directions. Internally, here it's always saying, sets the internal mode to save. Here is the, it's going to be detecting it's now doing a loading. When it switches between a load and a save, you need to dump all of your object ID data and pointer instance data that the archive had because the objects that I was remembering previously may no longer exist and the new objects getting written in may recycle those object IDs. So when it goes to change direction, it dumps its internal state, except for the data source. So I wrote out to the data source in the other thread, almost the reverse thing, we got the client, I bring a loop of five times, I read in, pardon me, right, read in this first node that got written out. 
I insert and add to that tree I map I, a node three called client, and this has a random number on it. This will make it so it gets in different orders in the tree. I turn around, I stream that back out. I go to repeat this count. I, when I stream it out, it ends up wrong way, coming back in here because it was waiting here to read this, inserts its own object, it's calling server, assigns it a random number and repeats, writes it out. The other one reads it in, does this thing and it reads here. Goes through this five times in and out, back and forth between the client and the server. They're exchanging information and building upon each other's information. If you wanted to, this could actually be a really big, comprehensive, uh, massive data structure that I wanted to pass off to some other server and have it crunch on that data for a while and then pass me back the answer. Here, I just came up with an artificial example to show that I can pass this back and forth. When I finally finish my five times through this loop, I draw the tree of what was what it was. You saw the client uh, thread there already. So two-way starting, uh, client starting, ser server starting, client starting, and this is doing the client reading, cl server reading, writing, yada, yada, back and forth. Here's the tree that it had. I started off with the root that I put in the middle. I balanced it at five. Randomly, it called the client, inserted a two. Next time back, it called the server. You know, back when we're going back and forth, server inserted a one or a three. Um, it went back and forth, and the client and server each inserted their name and a, a random number, and it built this tree out of it. Half the tree was built on one side, half was built on the other. Ah, okay. So, hour 15 minutes or so. Anybody still awake out there? Anybody have any questions? I remember there was a hand raised sometime earlier. Okay, I had that on a separate uh, screen. And, um, okay, Brett, screen is smudged. And Daryl, why not size of type? Four, and I guessing you might be talking about when I was actually writing out the type of the objects and the that was back during the array stuff and I kind of I kind of concluded that it would have been the same and just so it doesn't it was not really relevant to, at, at that point the count versus the, the, the whole size I don't of, think it size would of be array the same, versus though. size of type. No, because size of array gives you the size of type times the count. Right. This array is the entire um, array. It's not just the count of a single element. Does this that the, give the size of the array times the size of ty the size of count times size of type? Uh, si yes, yeah, size does. of array is the same as count times size of type. This is oh, the entire awesome. storage of the array. I've just never thought of it that way. Okay. I could have very easily just said size of type times count, but okay, I, I assume okay, I get it. Yeah, I thought that was a count in that field. Sorry, not the total size of uh, octets. Right. Okay. It could have worked either way. Yeah, I came in late. I'm sorry. I I I I, sh I and yeah. Okay. Zoe had a question about why not pass by value in that case. Yeah, I um, I forget exactly where this was, but essentially at, at some point you created, I, I, I you said um, you created a stack variable, just like a normal value and uh, assigned it so that you wouldn't, you know, um, modify the reference. Um. Oh, actually, I think I wrote down the slide here. Slide 40. That, that's what it was. Okay. And mm. 
Well, I could do that on the save, but on the load, I need to write back to that, so I need to have a reference to it. And I, sure, okay. I didn't need to have a reference here. I like symmetry, though. Yeah. It My only helped. point is you could get rid of one of the copies because you because you could get rid of. Wouldn't it be undata? Yeah. Um, it's not a big. I, it, yeah, it could probably go either way. However, byte order takes an unsigned type, and there's some internal math that's going on and some anding and oring and masking. That, and when I go to join them back together the byte order swap i think there's a case of where there could be a sign extend that happens if a byte had a high order value a high order bit that was set and you go to copy a byte into a 32-bit int it will take that top bit and replicate it all the way up from bit 8 bit through bit 31 so it looks like it's still a negative number because if it assumed that it was an assigned or an unsigned, well, it's probably, no, if it was signed, then it would do that byte extend. Um, so that, that's why I go through part of the pain of converting it to an unsigned type. I see. That's really interesting. Okay. Um, In the map, save does not take the pair by mutable ref, not const ref. Uh, I could have done a const ref there. Um, not sure if that would screw up some of my, I think it would. I want to go to serialize those datas out. That, then, the, for example, if it were an int, it would have to be a const type reference um, so I would have to have both uh, const and non-const uh, flavors of the templates I think is that true as long as you're not mutating it I don't think you need a, a mutable reference it's a contract for you as the within the method right okay uh so it, 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 it makes sure it makes sure you're being good and not you know mutating when you don't intend to. Yeah. Um, thanks for the kudos from people about very interesting, great presentation. Uh, where did my mouse go? There it is. It keeps going to sleep. Recognize the go for visitor pattern between serializable and archive. Yeah, they kind of go iteratively back and forth into each other recursively yeah. hierarchically down through a data structure until it hits a blocking point where it says I've already been here. Yeah, I, I this this pattern was was uh, uh, elucidated in great detail by the Gang of Four in their book about Oh yeah, gang, okay. uh, yeah. and and uh, and it would be helpful to your next audience uh, to call that out. And and say okay, you recognize here. This is the game. This is the the visitor pattern. Uh, and and for some of us who actually know what that means, it it's a good shorthand to uh, um, help us understand what's going on here. And I think I don't I can't uh, give another example but i think there's more than one example of the visitor pattern in in the software that you presented tonight which is very interesting by the way yeah um and you were asking who it was who invented or uh it's the <laughs> hmm? curiously recurring template pattern that yeah. was from a specific publication and, and that really ought to be cited if you're going to use it <clears throat> yeah um I've forgotten. You know, in, a, in, in the longer version of this, I when I had twice as many slides, I actually did introduce that. Um, I also talked a lot more about, um, and I wanted to give some little bit of respect to a much maligned uh, Microsoft Foundation classes. 
most everybody has bitched about MFC at some point or another, but MFC was doing this serialization in 1993. And yeah. in 1993, it was using this mechanism and it had a form of uh, reflection that I'm doing here. I thought I'd seen it somewhere before. <laughs> yeah. And MFC, if you were trying to use it wrong, it was hard to use. But if you were trying to use it the right way in the form that it was going through in the document view architecture, it actually worked pretty slick and pretty well. Mm -hmm. for, for in its day, what it was doing, considering that was 27-year-old technology, whereas most people now, I mean, C++ is 40 years old. 41 now mm -hmm. and it does not have reflection yet and it won't have it for another three or six years but i invented kind of reinvented what msc was doing and have a that's why i put it in parentheses pseudo reflection and it's kind of is i can create an object on the fly out of nowhere so okay other questions and Brett, I want to know what screen is smudged. Uh, okay, so I have a question about reliability of this streaming infrastructure. So at Microsoft, there is kind of common practice that if product reads a binary stream, it must survive uh, so-called phasing uh, test, meaning that it must survive reading of the uh, randomized garbage. So from your experience, uh, how often you can phase corrupted archive? Ah, in the much longer example, and in the code that you'll find out on the GitHub, um, there's multiple different things I want to point out about what's out there. But there's something called checkpoints that I constantly, as I'm, every time I write something out, and reading it back in, I'm keeping a checksum. And I have this function called, that I run on an archive, it's called checkpoint. And if it's streaming out, it saves what the checksum value is at that point. And when I'm reading back in, I um, read that checksum and make sure that's what I'm expecting. And then you, then it'll be a, incumbent upon the user to check the return value from checksum. Um, also strewn throughout this code in the more robust example that's not slideware, at the beginning of every function, it's checking to see if it's already in an error state. There's a lot more error cases of checking different states that are going on, if counts aren't matching, if types aren't the, what was expected of throwing errors and the moment any error happens, it unwinds itself and just returns error, returns error, returns error, and everything silently fails. And then it's incumbent upon the user to check to see if there was an error. Um, as far as if there's the bad data out there, if it's gonna entirely crap out, it is possible but mo very frequently, it's either writing big blobs of data or it's actually looking at object IDs or, or type IDs. And if it doesn't know about those object IDs or the type IDs, those roll into a, the, the uh, trickle-up error. Um, if the hash is the wrong type of hash and not found, that's the wrong type I type info so that gracefully is handled um i can't say that every case in here is going to be perfect but uh, it's reasonably robust so basically the hash uh is a synchronization points uh makes sense so basically um, if well, you go out of synchronization you can find the next hash point and uh, restore the synchronization. Um, no, the it, it's a, a, abusing terms here. The hashes are used for the uh, type info objects. 
and uniquely identifying a class. This is a checksum. It's a rolling checksum that's being strewn into the uh, uh, into the file of every time you say checkpoint, it writes that value. And then it also, every time you say checkpoint, when it's reading, it reads that value and validates it against what it expected the checksum to be at that point. And there's actually a little special gotcha, special case. When you're reading the checksum value, that is actually affecting the checksum value. So I actually have to read it, save off the current value of what the checksum was that I had been reading in, read the checksum, and then compare them, um, knowing that the value I just read of those numbers is affecting future values of the checksum. Um, it is one, if where these checksums are for these checkpoints, they're non recoverable. Um, it basically will tell you that there was a problem and the value wasn't what it was expecting. When I was first going through, when I first wrote this a couple years ago, I was debugging it. And if I wasn't perfectly writing everything out in the same order and reading it back in in the same order, not only every class has to write serialize in and out in their own perfect order, but they have to um, each a uh, template function has to save out each data for the data type and the counts and all those things in the exact same order as they get read back in. And it took us a long time to do that. Something else which surprises people a little bit, when I'm traversing the tree here, many times you think of, oh, I'm at object A at the top of the tree, I'm gonna write this whole thing out then I'm going to go to the next object in it, write that hole out and the tree. No, this is actually traversing it. And let me go way back to the beginning here. Come on. Uh, this tree. As I'm coming down through here, I might save off half of this data. Go to this object, save off half of this data. Go to this node, save off all of its data, return, save some more data here, write out this whole object, traversing in. And, and so I follow the whole outline of this. And if there's a value at the very beginning of two and a value at the very ending of end, or the very end of two, those might be the first and last bytes in the file. And everything is stretched across or stuffed in between the beginning and ending of two. An extra feature that I have, which I think I did not post in the uh, GitHub, is this is extensible in that you can make your own classes that you throw into this thing. And I have one that I called a node header or header node that contains the name of the archive in it and a version number. So as you're reading through this, you can make decisions based off that version number that you wrote out and read it in differently using the data format from an earlier instance. Your newer version may go to serialize in and out, and it might have four or five new data members, which of course weren't there when it was getting written. So you have to be able to version your file and version your schema of your serialization function. So where it's doing the uh, is save and then the else for the load inside of that else you might have to put a version and a switch statement uh, saying case was this version one version two version three and know how to handle that different something else which i didn't which i had to cut out of here which i found was a nice little feature the idata source that pure interface I can make an iData source filter that basically does nothing but read. You could call and write to it, and it turns around and passes through, and it calls another iData source. It becomes a chain. In your filter there, you could apply some encryption to the bytes that are being passed through. And I had one that was doing just a simple XOR. And so as it was writing it, it would XOR every byte 
so I would I would create it of uh, file data a data source file. I would pass that into the filter from the filter. Then I would pass that into the archive. Anything being written to or from the file would go through this XOR and converted. I could at different given points in my hierarchy of my serializing, I could say I'm now going to use an A5 for my XOR. And now I'm going to use a 8E. Um, well, those are common numbers in doing XORs because of the way the toggles and all the other, every other bit. But you could have random kind of XORs you apply to this. And even another little clever trick is I can come, I can use a random number as an XOR. If I write it into the stream before I, I do the XOR, when the guy who's turning around and reading it back in, he can just read an int and go, oh, that's my new mask. I'm going to switch to now doing the XOR with this new mask. And maybe I'll throw some examples of that together and put it in my GitHub uh, for this. Sorry, but as opposed sorry. to doing just an XOR, it could do a, a full encryption with a big massive key. Yeah, you had a qu question there? Uh, sorry for interrupting. Feel free to continue with the questions, but I need to stop the recording just in case I would like to, to let you know. Okay, thanks Robin. Okay, I stopped the recording now. Okay.